evening, welcome, and thank you for participating in tonight's virtual town hall hosted by Tacoma's 27th District Legislators. Speaker Lori Jenkins, Representative Jake Fye, and Senator Yasmin Trudeau. Thank you to those of you who submitted questions in advance. We'll start tonight's event by relaying those questions to the lawmakers. You may also submit a question live in the comments section of the platform from which you are watching. Please submit your questions now, and we'll try to answer as many as we can over the next hour. Before we get started, the lawmakers will give some brief opening remarks. Speaker Jenkins, would you like to get us started? Thanks, Aaron. It's great to be here with uh, with you all this evening, and I'm excited to be able to talk about some of our legislative session with you and to respond to your questions. Just so you know a little bit about um, uh, me and where I uh, come from, I uh, was elected to the legislature 12 years ago. That's hard for me to believe because I still feel like a little bit of a newbie in the legislature. That's one of the great things about this job. I'm constantly learning um, things and it's so uh, wonderful to have a job like this. Uh, I've served on any number of committees, but the ones that I've spent the most time on have been um, the uh, health and uh, human services, or excuse me, the health care committee, the health and wellness committee. Uh, in the House. I spent uh, 10 years before I came became speaker on that committee. And then I chaired the Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee. Also, I sat on the Appropriations Committee, which was the primary budget writing committee. But I, I've actually served on all three budget writing committees throughout my service in the House. I've served on the Transportation Committee earlier, as well as the Capital Budget Committee. Uh, in 2019, I was elected Speaker of the House. Now I only serve on one committee. It's the House Rules Committee, and it's the committee that decides what bills are eligible to move to the floor, uh, but I serve as speaker, so my job is to manage um, the whole place in a lot of ways, and I don't actually sponsor legislation myself, but basically every bill that goes off the floor of the House is a bill that I've um, that I've reviewed and worked on somewhat. So that's, um, that's my perspective. So you want me to, should I kick it to I, you? I will, go, I will go second. I guess I'm second in seniority in, in uh, representing the good citizens of the 27th district. Um, I've been in the legislature 10 years. Uh, prior to that time, I was on the Tacoma City Council for seven years. Um, the last four years, I've been chair of the House Transportation Committee. Enjoyed that very much, and that takes a lot of time. As the speaker indicated, it is a committee that develops a budget. Um, and so a lot of work goes into making sure we get the priorities right about how we spend the, uh, the dollars that are collected from our transportation revenues. Um, I also serve on the Environment and Energy Committee um, and uh, enjoy that work as well. It has a good connection um, with transportation because uh, by way of example, uh, Carbon usage, uh, the largest carbon usage in the state of Washington comes from the transportation sector, and that's an environmental problem that we, we must address. So pleasure to be here. I look forward to your questions. Awesome. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining today and taking the time out of your day. Uh, Yasmin Trudeau. I'm the newest member of the 27th uh, LD delegation. I was appointed in November, uh, officially November 2nd by the County Council, um, and I've really tried to hit the ground running. I have actually never served in a, in a sort of public official uh, appointed or elected capacity. So it's all pretty new to me in that way. But I was, I did, I was very lucky to have served as the legislative director for our state's attorney general, Bob Ferguson. So at least familiar with the process and, um, I think that makes me even more appreciative that I have two seatmates, the chair of transportation and the speaker of the house who I've been able to learn from. And just, it, it makes me feel really lucky that we have this much knowledge and expertise here in, in our, in our city and in our district. So um, the three committees that I sit on are the three that I requested, which I feel really lucky about that's housing, human services. And I serve as the vice chair of the law and justice committee in the Senate. So all very relevant issues from, and you know, all the issues that our community is facing. So just really appreciative and also look forward to the questions. All right, great. And we'll jump right in with a question from Naomi. And Naomi asks, uh, what were your focuses at the start of session? Well, maybe I'll just kick off at, at a very high level. Um, uh, there were, for the House Democrats, and I really think these fall into the same categories uh, for the Senate, um, I think, but 
we had four priority areas that we worked in uh, this session. The first was uh, uh, economic well-being for Washingtonians. And one of the things that we have seen over many uh, kind of economic downturns and challenges over our history is that folks who move into these times who, who are in a fairly good situation come out of them uh, doing okay. But people who go in really on the edge or having a difficult time come out of uh, challenging times in a much worse position. And we were really committed to making sure that people were doing better coming out of the pandemic, not not that no one was doing worse. And so our focus was really um, to make sure that everybody's economic well-being was improving. The other thing is we wanted to, the second thing is that we wanted to make sure that we were serving Washingtonians in a way that the services were really most helpful to them and most useful to them. So we focused in that area. Our third area of priority, uh, which was also an area of priority last year was uh, racial equity and justice um, and advancing issues in that area. And it's taken us a long time to get where we're at and it'll take us a long time to get to a better place. So that'll probably be a priority for us for a long time. And then the final focus area for us was addressing climate change uh, and our transportation package that Rep. Fi uh, led on um, really was our the the, the marquee thing that we did related to climate change. There are literally dozens of bills and dozens, dozens and dozens of investments in our budget that address those four areas. We can talk about them more um, during the course of this, but um, I'll kick it over to um, Senator uh, Trudeau and Rep. Fi. To, Senator Trudeau ran a number of bills that were highly successful this year and Rep. Fi's leadership on the transportation package was extraordinary. Senator Trudeau, why don't you go ahead? Okay, thank you. Um, well, you know, I'll just be really candid. I think being appointed in November and starting in January, I was just trying to figure out how I could represent, um, you know, the constituents of this district as best I could. I did introduce um, 11 bills in a 60-day session, so a little ambitious, but I was able to get five priorities across. But my, my overall goal was to bring what I've experienced. I try to use my lived experience to inform, you know, policy and budget priorities. So really thinking a lot about about uh, behavioral health support and just the, the different ways that mental and behavioral health have impacted our communities over the last, especially over the last two years. Um, child care access issues, that's really relevant. I have a three-year-old, uh, as and many of us have survived um, as parents during the pandemic, and thinking a lot about housing and homelessness, um, which is at the forefront, I think, of everybody's mind. So I tried to focus as best I could on not just bills that I introduced, but just air those three areas and how we could push that forward through the through the budget and also through legislation. So and then I just tried to hang on for the ride. <laughs> well, you did a great job. You did a great job. So uh, for me, it was um, trying to see if we in a short legislative session could advance some transportation investments for the good people of the state of Washington. Um, short sessions uh, don't usually yield something as significant as a transportation package, um, but uh, with great cooperation from uh, the leadership on the Senate and the House, we were able to to complete that. Um, and it is a uh, it was a hope for um, and uh, an opportunity we want to take advantage of, particularly because we had recently passed the Climate Commitment Act, which has uh, investment dollars to reduce carbon and provide uh, multimodal investments in active transportation and transit. And we also had the federal passage of the IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment Act. Um, and uh, But we needed more than that in order to address some very significant, op uh, some opportunities, but also some critical investments that needed to be made. Um, and we were able to do that. And I'm sure we'll have some follow-up um, questions to discuss that. But we, we had a court case that required us to make investments uh, and do the right environmental things to um, uh, reinstitute uh, passable fish passages that would work out for, for restoring our salmon. Um, and then also we had... Uh, very big challenges with the ferry system and we really needed to upgrade um, our ferry. So those are just a couple of things, but it was uh, fortuitous circumstances, but we were 
uh, able to take advantage of the circumstances and, and get, I think, a very meaningful package past the session. Great. Thanks. And folks, for, for you out there watching us, please, if you have a question, enter it into the platform uh, from which you're joining us. Uh, our next question comes from Melissa, and Melissa has a question about housing. Melissa is asking uh, asked what the legislature did this year about uh, making housing more affordable. I, mean, I guess I'll I guess I'll take that one and and then I would defer to the speaker who got to make sort of the big picture calls on on budget and other issues but we did a lot um I that, that's what I I honestly when it comes to housing I mean there was 440 million dollars dedicated to housing in the capital budget that includes rapid capital ra rapid capital housing acquisition um we got a, a, about 115 million. Uh, in the housing trust fund, there was about 15 million available for homeless youth facilities, about $9 million for competitive grants to local governments to assist in the cost of utility improvements for new affordable housing projects, um, and $2 million for rapid housing community preservation, So, uh, which would go towards manufactured and mobile home communities. So those are a few of the highlights that were in there. Um, I track capital budget closely. I actually see staff capital budget in the Senate. So it's an area that I'm a little from, more familiar with, but I don't know if the speaker or um, Chair Pai wanna, wanna add into that, but it, there's, there's a lot. There was a big focus in, on this issue and I'm just really proud of my colleagues for all standing together on housing. Yeah, I would say a couple of things that I'm really excited about is that we have typically constructed low income housing. And that's a lot of what the half a billion dollars that we moved from the operating budget into the capital budget did this year. But for the first time, we've also invested in housing acquisition uh, for people. And that, I think, is really important because as we start to see our work on racial equity moving forward, because of the history of redlining and uh, and Black, Indigenous, Asian American, and Latin, Latino uh, communities not being able to buy housing, those families have a hard time accumulating assets as a family, right? One of the best ways you can do that is to acquire a house. And, and that creates great asset building in your family. So we invested, I think about 25 million. It's a small dollar amount to start, but we'll continue to uh, hopefully invest in that. And then we also focused a lot on people who are in rental housing, again, providing um, some uh, rental assistance for folks, but also some uh, land, some mitigation funds to landlords also as people are moving into different places. And then utility assistance for people too, whether they're uh, in a home that they own in rental housing or whatnot. Um, actually, $160 million in um, utility assistance. So a lot of investments and many of those investments, for example, the low, the, the low income housing constructions, we construction, we really do that with local cities and counties. So, you know, watch for our cities and counties as they get engaged on this work too. Great. And our next question uh, comes from Laura. And Laura asks, uh, what transportation fixes can our community expect to see this year? Well, I think uh, this year, well, what you're going to see in this year is um, we provided the remainder of the funds that are necessary to um, build out um, the what is called uh, the gateway project, both in um, South King County, but more importantly for this district in the 27th district from uh, I-5 and Fife into the Port of Tacoma. That construction, um, that contract has been let and now we have all the funding that we need to, to build that out. So that project will be very visible as the construction um, begins, I guess probably within a couple of months. Um, we're going to be running pretty close to finishing up, finally, um, I-5 uh, through Tacoma, and the, the, uh, the, which will add um, an HOV lane for folks to be able to use. So that extension now will go from where it leaves off currently at the King County line all the way to the Tacoma Mall. And in the package, um, we put additional funding in to carry that forward south um, to 512 and JBLM. So uh, a lot of action on I-5 and related um, uh, 
freeways, but there will also be some investments that will take place. Um, you'll see more and more construction um, that we're facilitating with the Sand Transit build out south to, to the Tacoma Dome. Hey, can we jump back a little bit on the housing? Because I really would love it if Senator Trudeau would talk to people about a couple of bills that she uh, got passed this session um, related to housing locally that'll help us a lot here. Thank you. Um, yeah, there were two bills that I that I introduced and were passed. One of them was around uh, just reducing barriers for folks being able to pay rent and for landlords to have an easier time in collecting that rent, which now... Um, Prior to the session, a property management company or a landlord could require that an individual only use an electronic payment portal. And what I heard from many people that I knew, my, my mom included, um, and, and what I'd heard from community, especially seniors on fixed income, is this was a really big barrier for folks. Not only did they uh, have just, they weren't as familiar with using online uh, payment processes, but also um, having to pay to pay. So there's a fees attached with that electronic portal. So that was sort of a low barrier um, issue that got a lot of support <clears throat> in both chambers. Uh, and the other one was around development of housing. So now there's a, a Senate Bill 5755 that passed and was just signed into law, focuses on the issue of unused surface lots and parking lots, which we see a lot of here in Tacoma. So it's actually a sales and use tax deferral to help with affordable housing development. And to the speaker's point earlier, that includes, uh, when I talk about affordability, that includes both low income and workforce housing um, incentives in there. So those were just two areas that I was able to maybe make a little bit of impact that our community members can feel. So thank you, Speaker Jenkins. I appreciate that. All right, great. And uh, next we'll go to a question from John. And John has a question about, uh, he, he asks, so what can the legislature do to help promote regrowing the tree canopy and creating pro-forest policies here and across the state? Has the legislature considered raising the limit on money to be directed to conservation districts? Wow. <laughs> well, uh, I guess I'll just start off a little bit. I think that's a great, uh, John, that's a great uh, question. I don't think we've done very much. I'll have to go back and look and see. We have talked a bit about um, conservation districts. And one of the challenges is always that there are many, many junior taxing authorities in, in Washington state, a real plethora of them. And honestly, every time you prioritize one taxing district over another, then it has real challenges in terms of what those taxing districts can do, right? Metro parks versus con conservation districts. So it probably is worth doing um, some real work on um, how those junior taxing districts are funded and are, and are allowed to, to tax. We do have a tax structure work group that's been going for two years and it's bipartisan, bicameral. We're expecting by the end of the year to get a lot of recommendations from them uh, to in part to just try to create a more progressive tax structure or at least a less uh, less unfair tax structure than what we've got right now. Washington is uh, considered to be the state that has the most unfair tax structure in the United States. Um, so I'm hoping and expecting that we may see some recommendations about all these junior taxing districts that may help us develop a better approach to how we fund there. But great, I think great call out on tree canopy uh, and something that we definitely um, uh, can work on more. Great, all right. Uh, next question comes from Patricia. And uh, Patricia would like to know how she can uh, join the virtual town hall if she doesn't have a Twitter, Facebook or YouTube account. So how can she see you guys elsewhere other than this virtual setting? Well, we have a session coming up just uh, next week on, uh, I believe it's on the 3rd of December at the North Point Center from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we've done these for several years now, and it's always a great opportunity um, for to really have a conversation with, with constituents um, because we really... Um, as we do our work, we kind of get um, in our little uh, areas of expertise and we sometimes can really miss out on really what's on the mind of constituents within our district. So 
Um, as I said, we have an opportunity, I believe it's on Tuesday at between 11 and 1 p.m. at the North Point Center for anybody within the district to join us. And I would just add that I think, you know, anybody that's interested in engaging, um, I think what I've what I've found really great about this delegation is a value that I hold dear, which is accessibility. So I think if folks are really interested in digging in on tree canopies or whatever um, other issues, sometimes, you know, I would say often the best solutions are derived from communities. So there's lots of ways to access us. And I, I think there's going to be more than one um, coffee chat coming up as well. So the first one out of a few um, and maybe I'll defer to the defer to the speaker if she knows the specifics on whether the other ones have been scheduled yet, but there will be more. So it's not like there's just one opportunity next week. Just next week happens to be uh, the soonest one coming up. Yeah, we're definitely trying to do them across um, from now until December. So, um, so I would suggest that if you want to know more about when they when they are to email our offices and actually any of you who are on this call right now can if you want to meet with with any of us you can email the office i'm sure that our email addresses will come up on the screen at some point and um and set up a meeting with us we're happy to do that it's one of my favorite things to do is just meet with constituents in local coffee shops um and have great coffee Great. Uh, next, we have a question from Hannah. Uh, Hannah asks, what are you all doing to ensure community safety? Sure. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'll just start by saying I think community safety is um, part of why I picked the, the three committees that I picked, right? Because I think it really is a three-legged stool, which is it includes a component of public safety, which is the way that our systems interact with individuals, right? So policing, the judicial system, but also looking at ways to promote health and well-being in our communities. So that is, you know, proper access to, to the services that we need, behavioral health, mental health support, um, and making sure that, you know, we're incorporating um, the, the ways that we can stabilize our community members too. So access to housing. So I sort of see the three three-legged stool. And I think the legislature did an incredible job. I certainly can't take credit um, for the conversations that that I was a part of that were already happening um, around investments in all of those areas. So I think there's lots to be proud of and lots to point at, but I defer to my seatmates if there's any specifics that you all want to address. Uh, I'll just, I'll say that I think our focus um, our focus in the House and generally as the legislature is we want to what kind of what we're trying to get to is we want to make sure that law enforcement has the tools that they need to protect people and is also held accountable when they violate the public's trust. Right. Which is, I think, also what people really want. Um, so this year we did a lot of work to kind of fine tune our accountability bills from that we passed last year to make sure that they were really working in community. But then we all what we also have seen is um, a, a, as we see in many, many areas where there's a shortage of people moving into them, a shortage of workforce. Uh, so we we. Um, we uh, also really uh, increased the funding by almost 50% of the Criminal Justice Training Commission to train more officers, because what we want is officers who are out there, you know, most officers are out there trying to do really good work and they want to be well-trained well so we can get more local officers and state patrol officers out there. We, uh, out of the Transportation Committee came a bill that will diversify our um our state patrol. And then one of the um, other big issues, I mean, I think in to we probably invested maybe 20 million more dollars or so um, in uh, law enforcement. And one of the big areas was to um, update pensions for law enforcement officers, which is another big issue for recruitment to try and recruit and get more people to come into the field. So there are other um, smaller things that we uh, also funded that work there. And then I just want to talk, I know I did this in the last town hall, but I I just think this has been such a really good idea that we move forward is every place I go, I hear about catalytic converter theft. Um, every neighborhood in Tacoma has this problem. So we really wanted to deal with it um, here in Washington. And one of the stuff we saw from all the research is just like, it's already criminal to 
steal a catalytic converter, making it more criminal doesn't do anything to suppress thefts. So that's what we wanted to do. Um, and we really, we use some good national data to design a program in which now we are focused on the third party purchasers. So the legislation that we passed this year will say, if you are a purchaser of catalytic converters, you have to get proof that the person who's selling it to you owns the vehicle that the catalytic converter came from. And you're going to be liable if you don't do that. And we've seen in other states that that has started to drive down the demand of catalytic for catalytic converters um, and uh, really address this issue of catalytic converter theft. So um, we're trying to adopt really smart policy that will actually have a, an effect um, on the, the crime issues that we're seeing. In addition to what the speaker commented on in terms of diversifying uh, the employees of the Washington State Patrol, so they really are people that um, represent the different communities we have within, within this wonderful state, uh, we made permanent this year um, committed to paying competitive salaries for our state troopers. Um, they suffered for many, many years with pay that was quite a bit lower than many of the cities in the state of Washington, and it was hard to keep um, a, a state patrol at a reasonable size of workforce. So that piece of legislation makes it permanent that we're going to be paying a competitive wage, and hopefully that'll result in having people stay with the state patrol and uh, make it a career. All right. Our next question comes from Thomas. And uh, Thomas uh, asked, despite record revenue, why didn't the legislature cut taxes? Well, we we actually did. But um, I'll just let me talk about what I think our focus was. Our focus, uh, one, we had a we had a significant amount of both um, state revenue this year, but even more federal one time federal dollars. So I just want to be clear that long term tax reductions on one time only money doesn't really work. Um, but the other thing is, when I talked at the beginning of this um, session, that was our focus was making sure that people come out of um, the economic downturn and the pandemic in a really healthy way. So our work was to invest in um, in the in businesses and in families that were having real challenges. So for example, we invested a hundred million dollars in the hospitality industry. Um, um, it, this year because we heard from the hospitality industry that that, not a tax cut, but us investing money in that industry is what they really needed to rebuild. We also heard that from the arts community and invested uh, $20 million there. One of the things we heard from our small business community, though, is that they could that a B&O tax cut for our small and main street businesses would really help them keep their feet under them. So we did that. And we're going to have 125,000 small businesses uh, small and main street businesses in Washington state that are either going to end up paying no B&O tax or a much reduced B&O tax. So we tried to be um, targeted to have the an effect and have the effect that um, folks were asking us to have, um, help them have. Um, so that's how we focused uh, our, um, our revenue. It doesn't always make sense to do a broad-based tax cut when you have the most regressive tax structure in the country because you end up returning money to folks who maybe um, are at the higher end of the scale sometimes. Um, so our regressive tax structure really creates problems for tax cuts too. And I would just add on to that, that a lot of those cuts focused on, you know, uh, relief for small business, right? Or sort of opportunities for economic growth, making sure that we're stabilizing our business community so that those investments can go back. Um, you know, we don't, we aren't a healthy, thriving community if our businesses are closing. So we also did things like waiving liquor license fees and others um, to an industry. Uh, when we talk about hospitality, like restaurants and bars that have really been struggling to keep their doors open if they've been able to at all. So I think thinking about how that actually is a, is a shared benefit for all of us um, and will lead to more economic growth in the future is uh, something that I took away from those budget discussions. Uh, up next, we have a question from Jerome. Uh, Jerome asks, with student loan payments paused again by the federal government, what are you doing to help make college more affordable for people? 
I can talk a lot about this, but I feel like I'm talking. <laughs> <to them. laughs> so I'm trying to you be, should trying to pause and wait for somebody yeah. else. <laughs> well, there was a, you know, I, I would highlight there was a, a student loan program um, that was introduced by Representative Sullivan in the in the House that got passed on a one percent um, interest rate for student loans. I would defer to you, Speaker Jenkins, because you probably are way more familiar with the policy. But we did get that um, off the floor, and that is um, that that is unique for Washington state. I think we're a leader in that regard. Yeah. I mean, so one, we have the Washington college grant, which actually funds um, a huge percentage now of students who are going to college in Washington state fully funds their tuition and some money toward room and board. So one of the other things we did in the budget is expanded that college grant this year because we have a lot of people who are going off to college who childcare is a huge issue for them. Transportation is a huge issue for them. Food is a huge issue. So provided more money into the college grant and allowed that money to be spent on some of those items um, to make to make it easier for folks to go to college. Then added to that is the 1% um, student loan program, which which will be the lowest, um, the the lowest uh, in interest rate in the nation for student loans. It's lower than any of the national loans that people can get. And this is again to help folks who. Um, Gosh, we go up pretty high into the federal poverty level for folks to be able to get the college grant, as well as this, this um, loan. So it'll help people be able to bridge. And then the other thing we did was invested a fair amount of money to um, provide assistance in high schools to help students fill out their financial aid form to get more students who would naturally be eligible for this to be able to um, apply for financial aid and get the college grant, get the these loans and see that they actually can go to school without coming out with a huge debt. All right, and folks, if you're if you're watching us and you got a question, please uh, put it into that chat, and we'll 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 try to get to you. And we've actually got a question from Paula from the chat here right now. Uh, Paula says, "I understand that legislators have very few staff res resources. This impacts your ability to communicate with constituents, do research on bills, etc." We're losing women and minorities as a result. What can be done to change this? Well, I mean, I guess since I'm a woman and a minority, <laughs> I'll go there. <laughs> the challenges are real. Um, you know, I think the way that the legislature has been designed was as a part-time legislature, but um, for, for communities like ours and many across the state, we have really engaged constituencies and issues that really um, continue throughout the year. So I think the challenge is the way that, um, you know, it was sort of originally set up. But I do think that um, there's a there's a big opportunity with those challenges, right? So part of the reason that I've uh, appreciated being able to, to be in this seat and continue to lift up my voice is how it is that my experiences, my lived experiences can come into play in the way that my, um, you know, colleagues can help support one another. And I think that I've, I've tried to do that. I've communicated to both of my seatmates on here and they've certainly showed up for me when I've had a, a toddler bouncing all around or that's been sick or that I can't make it to something. So I think figuring out how to collaborate and just really focus on teamwork until we can talk more about, you know, what systems changes are possible. Um, but I really think there are constraints in the way that the legislature has, has been set up. And that's not really anything that the three of us uh, can take on and resolving um, quickly. So i I would uh, open up the floor to others, but I think the challenges are real, but I think the opportunities are great. And I look forward to continuing to figure out ways to recruit and retain um, people that have that lived experience so we can continue to hear from them and, and support them. I, I just would say ditto to Senator Trudeau, but uh, one thing I do wanna clarify, Paula, we actually have more women and more people of color serving in the legislature now than in the history of this legislature. And certainly since I came, those numbers are growing. And that's actually part of why we're now seeing the difficulties in being a legislator and these challenges that Senator Trudeau mentioned, because we have more people who have kids that they're responsible for. We have more people who are, you know, their um, economic situation is much more, the economic situation of members is much more diverse than it used to be. Um, so we have many more members who need to work um, 
uh, while they're serving and things like that. So this highlights the problems that we have to solve. I'm not going to tell you we've solved them all, but I think actually it's it's been a gift of having more women and more people of color serving that's brought this to us as as, as things we have to work on and figure out how to address so that we can continue to build and keep the diversity of the legislature that's that's been growing. All right, next we'll go to uh, Samia. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Samia asks, I'd like to ask about state bankruptcy law reform and the possibility for proposed legislation for the upcoming year. Hundreds of working families are being dragged down by our unjust system that favors large corporate, often healthcare creditors. I just want to give a shout out. I think it's Samia. And if it's the Samia, I know. Hey, Samia. Um, so, um, but it looks like Speaker Jenkins was about to speak up. I know we had a couple of bills that were introduced, but didn't, didn't go through one around prejudgment interest, um, and other, other areas of focus, but speaker, go ahead. Samia, right on to your question. Um, I've spent a lot of time working on both chair before I became speaker, working on charity care and and the other issue is um, collections, medical collections. And we made a ton of progress before I became speaker on that, like not allowing collections to have interest rates to them, not allowing them to. I mean, it used to be that that I don't think there were hardly any doctor's offices that did this. But from the minute that you went to see a physician in their office, they could start charging interest on your bill. Uh, that you, they can't do that anymore. Um, but uh, but I think that you know medical bankruptcy is one of the biggest reasons for bankruptcy in the state, and that's why we did things like um, uh, you, know, you know now for diabetics, uh, you know insulin has sometimes is as much as six hundred dollars for a bottle. It's going to be seventy five bucks for a bottle in Washington State at least for the next year. We're hoping that the federal government will also address this, but we may need to extend it longer. Chair, we will have the best charity care policies in the um, nation as a result of uh, Tara Simmons' bill. We've also uh, prohibited balance or balanced or surprise billing, uh, where you go into the emergency room or you go somewhere and you get treated for somebody that, by someone that you didn't realize was outside of your network for um, uh, your insurance network, and then you get a gigantic bill. We've we've uh, we've said that it's not legal to send a surprise bill to somebody um, in that way. So we keep on working on these things around the edges. Everyone knows that we need to have more comprehensive reform in the healthcare industry. Um, and that is going to have to come likely at the federal level, but we're going to keep on chipping away at it here in the at the state level. And I would just add, Sammy, if you have specific thoughts on this, this would be, you know, please reach out to me or uh, to Representative Fire, or, you know, uh, Speaker Jenkins about if you have a particular experience or thing that you want to highlight, because we we might not know. Um, the prompt for the question and maybe the solution comes from what you've experienced. So please do reach out. All right. And our next question is uh, about healthcare. Uh, one of the top priorities is affordable and accessible healthcare. What progress do we make toward improving our healthcare system this year? <laughs> well, I just noted that I just noted a bunch of our three, three bills and it was, I just want to tell a little, a, a side story about this, uh, I was at Green River Community College on um, Friday and listening to the president as he talked about these things. And the mem our members of Congress were sitting right in front of me. And it was it felt really good. I'm, I'm not saying that like we've perfected everything in healthcare, but it felt really good to have the president talking about doing um, a insulin $35 a bottle. And I got to lean forward to the, our members of Congress and say, we did that. And then the next thing he talked about was balanced billing, um, surprise billing. And I leaned forward and I said, we did that. Um, and uh, then he didn't talk about charity care, but it was really great to know that we are working hard um, uh, to to be kind of on the forefront and help the nation, you know, be a leader for the nation um, on this um, uh, kind of stuff. But we also did things on uh, telemedicine. We've learned a lot during um, COVID that um, that it's people can get great medicine 
through just the phone or, you know, video conferencing. And we had this weird glitch in our law that didn't allow full reimbursement for telephone calls. And so now we do, we will allow um, that. Um, we did a lot of stuff on behavioral health, which Senator Trudeau has talked about. So um, we've made a lot of advancements. I don't want to repeat everything. And I'm just, I'm talking ad nauseum here. So um I'm hoping we'll move to questions on, on uh, reply <laughs> and quiz him a little bit. I'm clearly very excited about everything we've done and getting all your questions. Uh, our next question comes from Addie. Um, Addie has a question about hate crimes and is a hate crime survivor herself. And she'd like to know what the legislature is doing to support survivors. Um, I'll just speak up here. So my, um, I want to highlight that there was a, a hate crimes working group that happened at the attorney general's office. There were some recommendations that came forward. I think you'll continue to see policymakers uh, introduce those recommendations and, and look at how we can um, better address them. But I will say, Addie, I, the, the specific question that I'm seeing in the comments um, in terms of holding police accountable around police reports, it, that it, it might be really nice. Well, it would be really nice if you would reach out and share your experience on this, because I think it's hard to answer a question if we haven't heard what the what the problem or the issue is. But I think hate crimes is at the forefront of a lot of folks' mind. And I was formerly the a commissioner on the Asian Pacific American, or the Commission of Asian Pacific American Affairs in the governor's office. So the hate crimes issue is alive and well, but I think the opportunity to hear from folks, especially survivors, is going to be really important in informing how we move forward on policy. So just please do reach out and you can, there'll be details about, oh, there they are, how you can contact us, but we'd love to hear from you. All right. And up next, we have a question from Tom. Uh, Tom has a question about this year's uh, police accountability uh, clarification bills. Uh, House Bill 1719 and uh, 1735 did a good job of cleaning up language on last year's great reform bills. Uh, House Bill 2037 feels like a rollback on important protections. Terry stops are a key example where officer discretion is unfairly applied. Why did our district support this? Can you repeat that? Yeah, Aaron? sorry. Um, so uh, Tom says that uh, uh, House Bill 1719 and 1735 did a good job of cleaning up language on last year's great reform bills. Uh, but he says that House Bill 2037 feels like a rollback on important protections. And he adds that Terry stops are a key example where officer discretion is unfairly applied. And why did, why did our district support this? Senator Trudeau, do you want to talk about the details of the bill for, for folks? And then maybe we can all talk about where kind of where we're at on sure. the bill. Yeah, because yeah, I think you'll find that all of our, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to speak over you. I think you'll find that we we all took different approaches and come from different places and in our lived experience on these issues. So I'm not sure. I think what threw me for a loop was why did our district sort of broadly support these? But I'd say 2037, there were a couple of things that were really key in that bill. One of them was around defining what force what force is, right? So I think there needed to be a clear definition and we heard that both from community and from law enforcement. Um, and I also think that there was, you know, an opportunity to look at where uh, where we found that folks were relying on um, ambiguity, some ambiguity that was left. And there were a lot of reforms last year. So there's going to be ambiguity when you have large reforms. I mean, we had what 13, 13 massive reforms, I think more than any other state in the country. Um, that did reduce police violence. I think it was 60% um, in terms of how many individuals were actually um, killed by law enforcement. Now, you know, I will just admit that my, I took a different vote um, on that, but mostly because I felt like there was an opportunity to narrow the scope of that bill um, and, and that didn't happen. And so I, you know, that, that's where me and my, my seatmates may have differed a little bit and I would defer to them on what their thoughts were, but I think there were many reasons why a version of that bill was important to pass. So I just want to be clear. There were some, some key things that it did that we needed to have happen. Um, and we heard that both from, a, you know, attorney general guidance uh, on evaluating the, the bills that passed last year. We heard it from community and we heard it from law enforcement. Um, 
I did vote yes when that when we narrowed it to looking at a criminal offense as opposed to just Terry stops. And so that's where, uh, you know, I differed. I differed a bit. I felt like we could have narrowed that. But unfortunately, when it came to the Senate floor, um, that is not where some of my colleagues were at. So but but I do think there were things in there we needed to do. All right, next we'll go to Alexis. Uh, Alexis uh, asks, uh, what did the legislature do to help support our K-12 students and teachers and their parents as they return to full in-person learning? A ton. Um, and, I, and, you know, Jake, this is an area that you work in a lot, so I just want to make sure if you, if you have anything sure. you want to start off with. Well, you know... Um, our, our best resource that we have is the, the great relationship the three of us have with, particularly with the Tacoma School District. And um, there were some real challenges um, that they faced because of, of the pandemic and um, numerous um, outcomes that come from the pandemic. Just, you know, just to state one is that it's a challenge that, that uh, young people have with mental health. Um, and, you know, there's a growing concern about, about youth suicide. Um, so uh, we look to, to our school districts in terms of, and, and it isn't the same for each one, but we look to our school districts to, to let us know where the, where the um, additional revenues ought to go to assist, to assist them in meeting, in meeting their needs and being able to continue to do the great work that, that has been done. So um, don't spend a lot of time on, on a lot of education issues because of my transportation work is a different budget area. But, um, you know, I think we have, we have listened and we have tried to, to fill the gaps. Uh, and I think we did a good job of filling the gaps, but as things progress, there's going to be more things that come up that we're going to have to address. Yeah, I mean, some of the, um, let me just briefly kind of respond to the question about 2037 and talk about my vote on that. Um, I think Senator Trudeau kind of outlined what the bill was about for, for people. Um, and, you know, my uh, my take on this is that we're going to continue doing um, doing work on law, enforce, on law enforcement issues and accountability issues for a very long time. Uh, when but the clarifications that we passed this year were necessary in part because law enforcement is implementing them. And so you've got to have folks um, uh, able to, to implement the law um, and not be confused about that. Now, we, it may happen that in years to come, we will continue, like there's more, there will be more readiness both in the community and in the law enforcement community to uh, take, to take, more action on this, but I think this, for, for me, this was the right choice to move forward on this year. Um, on K-12, I just want to say it's just, we, we've done just amazing work. Some of it is really kind of heartbreaking work. For example, because schools were closed for so much of the year, the way we typically fund schools is about how many, um, how many, we say, butts are in seats. And it would have meant that many of our schools would have lost funding. So we, uh, and we did not want that to happen. So we stabilized funding there. We also really saw that um, and have uh, learned that we have a lot of um, parents where English isn't the first language. So we uh, passed a bill um, to provide more language access to parents because parents, all parents want to be involved in their kids' education. And you want to make sure that they can be by having language access. And this is especially challenge, challenging for kids who have individual learning plans um, and those parents who really want to be involved in helping their student out. So that, that bill will really help. We are going to, uh, in the next year, every single school, every school in the state of Washington will be funded for at least one school counselor and one um, nurse. And then depending on the size of the school, more will come. We've seen that our children's uh, mental health has really been challenged through the pandemic. And this is a way that we can really help um, our young people uh, recover from the trauma that they've um, been through. We expanded um, uh, 
uh, free school meals. We also expanded outdoor education, um, which was really great because we've been having all these kids with a lot of screen time. So getting more outdoor education. And um, I live not very far from Sherman Elementary. And during the course of session, I got um, letters from fifth graders at Sherman Elementary really urging us to pass the outdoor education bill. And the very first uh, letter that I that I read said um, said to me, "Why are you treating us as puny mortals?" Um, and it, it had a question mark, and then every other statement had an exclamation mark behind it about why we should pass outdoor education. Um, and the letters were awesome from young people, so it was great to be able to do that. So those are just some of the things that we've done. Um, that we did on education. We also actually extended the ability for more retired teachers to come back and, um, and substitute um, because we know we've got a shortage of teachers. Um, so lots of, lots of things, big and little. All right. And our next uh, question and folks, if you're paying again, we're, we're getting close to the end here, but please, if you've got a, if you've got a question, please put it in the chat and we, we can uh, hopefully get to you here. Um, our next question comes from, from, oh, sorry. Senator no, Trudeau. I was just going to lift up, uh, you know, three of the things that um, I've, you know, I've experienced and felt and just want to take a moment to like pause and thank my colleagues for their support on this. But the access to school counselors, the free school meals as someone who grew up on free and reduced lunch, that is just such a huge thing. And I know it'll be a huge thing to our, you know, the kids in our community to, to have access to that uh, meal expansion and then language access. Um, I also come from a limited uh, English proficiency family and have a brother who has an individual education plan uh, who goes to Stadium High School now. And so I just want to thank um, everyone who worked on those three issues, because those were ones that I felt really deeply when they came forward. And I know other families will feel them, too. Great. Thank you. Um, next question comes from Zoe. Uh, Zoe asks, uh, climate change continues to ravage our state with increased forest fires, extreme weather and food supply shortages. What did the legislature do to address, address climate change this session? Well, I'll take that one. Um, I think the biggest thing that we did was we uh, took the uh, resources that come from the implementation of the Climate Commitment Act that was passed in the 2021 session, and we applied that. Um, that was over $5 billion over the next 16 years, and we applied that to... Uh, making transit more accessible, um, particularly in identified disadvantaged communities. Uh, we worked on um, raising the funding for that has been really pretty much neglected in terms of active transportation. So people have choices about, about how they get um, from one place to another. And, that, and uh, obviously there's substantial health benefits from investments and in client in um, active transportation. The transit piece of this includes free ridership on transit system, including um, the ferries and Amtrak for individuals 18 and younger, so that we can um, make it possible so that young people can experience um, how beneficial it is to use public transit to get around and uh, how for many people, it isn't all that necessary to have a, their own vehicle. Um, and then on carbon reduction, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think about 40 some percent of the carbon um, usage in the state of Washington is, is from transportation. So we're gonna be starting to make investments in things like drayage trucks, uh, which are generally older trucks that serve the port areas, which tend to be, um, have poor air quality. We're going to be making investments to change out those drainage trucks. Um, there's going to be big investments in electric vehicle um, incentives. Uh, you look for those to happen as well as electric vehicle infrastructure. Um, so transportation is the biggest um, and hardest uh, area to make changes in in carbon and but. That's where we we put our big focus this last session. So, fully, uh, nearly a third of the money that is was in the transportation package went towards carbon reduction. All right. Thank you for that. And I think our our final question tonight comes from Lucy, 
And Lucy asks what the legislature did to address homelessness and support youth experiencing homelessness this year. Sure, sure. I guess I'll, I'll jump in unless somebody else uh, would like to. There were a couple of things that I mentioned earlier. Um, as far as youth experiencing homelessness, I did have a bill that passed um, around. It, it was it was created the opportunity for unaccompanied homeless youth to consent to their own health care decisions. So what we found out um, hearing from homeless youth shelters is that there were barriers to things like accessing COVID vaccines, um, accessing COVID testing, which was then forcing shelters to make really tough decisions about who they were um, you know, allowing to stay there. And that obviously further destabilizes if you can't get into a shelter for, and you're particularly vulnerable if you're a youth. So I was able to work with advocates and the support of my seatmates to get that bill across. But there was also you know, investments made in access um, I'm, I'm trying to look for the, the specific number, but there was uh, money for housing specifically for homeless youth that was in the budget. There's lots of other investments. You know, when you look at human service investments, it's hard to say, OK, this is all uh, directed at folks experiencing homelessness, because I think when you invest in expanding food access, when you invest in behavioral and mental health supports, that in turn is going to impact large swaths of our community, including those experiencing homelessness. So, and that rapid acquisition, housing acquisition in the capital budget, that's a really big deal because that will allow for that wraparound service, um, for, for housing to be built with intentional wraparound services to get folks um, where they need to go and stabilize to then get into more permanent housing solutions. All right, and that's the end of our, our virtual town hall tonight. So thank you for everybody uh, that, that joined us and took time to participate. Um, I'll turn it back over now to the, the legislators for some closing remarks. Uh, Senator Trudeau, since you wrapped up last time, would you like to start? And then we'll go to uh, Representative Fye and Speaker Jenkins. Um, I just wrap up by emphasizing what I said earlier, which is please don't hesitate to reach out. I think um, often people feel like, oh, well, I have to wait until there's a, a town hall or there's, you know, sort of an issue that I can't that I can't ignore. And then I'll, I'll, I'll figure out a way to communicate it. But we our emails are, are in the comments section. Um, you know, all of our information, our office numbers are public. So if you have certain issues that you didn't get a chance to ask the question or you just want an opportunity to chat more thoroughly about some of the answers we provided, um, just please reach out. I think we're all we're all committed to being accessible and having those conversations, but also take you take us up on those coffee chats. Yes. Yeah, so we have the uh, community chat Tuesday, May 3rd from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the center at North Point. Excellent opportunity to have those conversations with us. Uh, you know, the best time to reach us, I think, is um, before session gets underway, when we have a little bit more time to have a conversation and not feel the rush of all the work that has to happen within that limited time period during the legislative session. It's a good time. We do all make ourselves available uh, for appointments, individual appointments or group appointments. Um, and, and that's a great time to, to be able to have the dialogue that's necessary so that we can actually help frame um, potential legislation that might be helpful to um, different members of the community or more broader issues that affect the entire state. So we look forward to the engagement. Um, the emails are important, especially those that are individual and that come from the heart of people and the experiences that we're having, um, we just, there's no substitute for, for having the personal experiences of members of, of this legislative district. Uh, the only thing I'll add in wrap up is I think one of the things that um, is hard for people sometimes in terms of reaching out to us is it, it, it feels like a natural thing to us and it might feel intimidating to you. Um, but we are really excited to learn from you and you don't have to have all the solutions to the problems or even really fully understand the problem. You just have to have your perspective of what's uh, happening. Um, the other thing is like, sometimes you'll meet with us and we'll realize this isn't really a state legislative issue. It's a local issue or it's a congressional issue, but we can also link you to the right people there. So don't feel like you have to figure out like 
exactly who's the right person and what's the right solution to everything before you come. That's what um, we're here to do is try and help explore the right solution with you. And we have incredible staff that will do research to try and help us find the right solution for the problems that and challenges that you bring. So I guess I would just uh, urge you, if you're feeling intimidated at all, please try to not do that and just know that we're excited to just be able to talk with you and find out what's going on and see what we can do to help. Great. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. And, and please do reach out if you have any uh, lingering questions. Have a great night. Take care, everyone.